Today is Tuesday, June 27th, 2023. Welcome to The Regiment, where public health pharmacists, pharmacy students, and our guests discuss the latest public health issues. Listen to find out how pharmacists and pharmacy students like me can improve population health, health equity, and patient care through advocacy and education. My name is Lucas Nicolau, and I am a final year pharmacy student at the University of Rhode Island, working with the Rhode Island Department of Health alongside my professor, Dr. Rapperk. And I'm Ashley Chirello, also a final year pharmacy student at URI, working with the Rhode Island Department of Health and Dr. Bradford. And I'm Dr. Bradford. I'm a clinical professor of pharmacy practice and clinical research at the College of Pharmacy and the academic collaborations officer at the Rhode Island Department of Health. The opinions expressed in this podcast by the hosts and guests don't represent the opinions of the United States government, the Rhode Island Department of Health, nor the University of Rhode Island. We are excited today to discuss a topic that is getting a lot of attention, which is the artificial intelligence or AI platform ChatGPT. If you've heard of ChatGPT but don't know what it is, it's a generative conversational AI system that will create human-like responses of images, videos, or texts and reply to questions or tasks that you would like to see done. This could range from things like getting new recipes for um, cooking, workout routines, or even having to write essays. What a lot of people don't realize is that while this is very recent, AI has been around, whether it be with Gmail autocomplete messages or iPhone spelling suggestions. And what is really interesting about this AI system is that it's trained through reinforcement learning, which generally just means that it learns the optimal behavior to get the maximum reward, similar to how children will explore the world and learn how they can achieve their goals to those means. So ChatGPT was developed by a company called OpenAI, and there's several different kinds of these chatbots. Like Lucas mentioned, ChatGPT is probably the most famous, so we're sticking to that. That's what we found in the literature. So OpenAI was an AI, and AI being artificial intelligence, and so we'll distinguish between AI and, and chatbots here in a second. So OpenAI was an AI research company that launched ChatGPT in November of 2022. Actually, a little before that, it's had several iterations, but the public version's been out there. So it goes all the way back to 2015, when a group of entrepreneurs and researchers, including famously Elon Musk and Sam Altman, created this this system. So we've been at this a long time. We always sort of think that AI is going to happen tomorrow, and you know, uh, Skynet is going to take us over from the Terminator movies, but uh, don't think we're there yet. So since 2015. The program's had many iterations, starting from GPT to GPT-1. It's currently GPT-4. We're promised more things after this. But GPT-4 is the most advanced. And each level of advancement is like exponentially better than the rest. So we can't think of this as like, um, you know, an iPhone 11 versus an iPhone 4 or things that were familiar there or some version of Zoom that we're recording this on versus the first version. I mean, it's really dramatically different in what each iteration does. So this program is backed by several investors, Microsoft being the most notable. So this is why this is the most prevalent in our sort of media info uh, sphere here. OpenAI also created other kinds of AI programs, such as DALL-E, which is a text-to-art generator. Several of my student colleagues here have talked about generating AI art, and so that's a whole other thing. And if you want to know more about OpenAI, not a sponsor of the program, you can go to openai.com. Yeah, I think that it is important to note that ChatGPT 1 came out actually in like June 2018. So that was not that far off from the ChatGPT that we have access to as the public that came out more recently. And I think it's just crazy how much they've changed and how much they've added from the first iteration to now. So really what our main focus is on today with ChatGPT is the implications and how it revolves around healthcare how it's currently being used, the implications of how it's used, as well as the future possibilities. Okay. And uh, clearly lots of companies are interested in this. This is sort of the next wave of, of tech. If it was first we had cell phones, and then we had data on cell phones. This is sort of the, the next leap. You know, we all thought it would be holograms, which maybe are coming with the AI development, but what? But we'll, we'll see here. So currently ChatGPT is collaborating with other companies to build sort of innovative products where AI would be advantageous to the consumer, such as deepening conversations. Remember, it's a chat bot. It analyzes data and gives you sort of an expected answer. So conversations with programs like language learners like Duolingo, which I use, they work with Khan Academy to help with education. Is AI going to replace education? I don't think we're there yet. We're going to kind of tone people down. 
It's good to be aware of what's going on. So Khan Academy sort of was the transformation in itself for helping people learn both in elementary and secondary and even college classes. And they were actually working with, ChatGPT was working with Iceland to preserve its language. Other major strides, the most recent ChatGPT are things that people like to have it do, like pass the bar exam to become a lawyer. And I think it's even past segments of the U.S. medical licensing exam. Again, is AI going to replace your lawyer and doctor? We're not there yet, but it's important to modify how, how this is. I think we're sort of middle of the road for it's going to take over the world to it's going to be unhelpful. I think it's going to be somewhere in the middle. Yeah, I think especially with the bar exam, I actually had saw that it not only passed it, but it passed it in like the 90th percentile. So it passed it with a pretty, pretty high, high markings which is really interesting to see moving forward with ChatGPT and the future of it. But in terms of healthcare, it's been shown to potentially save time with things like insurance denials, prior authorization requests, and additional paperwork that doctors may deal with from a day-to-day -day basis. Many providers often believe that the administrative burden of the healthcare system is a leading cause of burnout. And you know what better way to alleviate this than having a computerized assistant, basically. An oncologist from Ohio actually called Docs GPT, which is another AI model that's in its early stages, quote, a game changer after it drafted an appeal letter for a cancer patient with a heart condition, which then was approved by the insurance company within an hour, allowing the patient to receive a non-generic medication with few cardiac side effects. So of course, we should just have national health care. That's the ultimate public health solution here. We don't need AI to tell us that that is the most efficient solution here. However, maybe we are outsmarting and, and what I, I guess the cynic in me says that the insurance companies will create AI uh, filters, which we already have for student papers and things. Uh, my, my partner is a teacher and has used AI and her, uh, the people she follows, and they've discovered people who use AI to write assignments, even claiming that, that they did write it and their typical plagiarism checkers declared it free of plagiarism, but AI said, yes, AI wrote it. So it's one of those things where tech is going to happen on both sides of the, of the equation here, but definitely relieving paperwork, I think is, is good. And again, just like with any technology, I think we were just on a, on a zoom the other day and you know, there's, there's, it's not perfect. The program, the computer, my monitor, the connections, all this tech, not perfect. I have a lot of tech in my car not always perfect. So just like any sort of emerging technology or even established technology, ChatGPT is not perfect. And, and this is just like when we teach, whether I'm teaching my kids or teaching students on how you find reliable information on the internet, probably the most essential thing. We still need a human to critically evaluate that. And humans need to tell humans what to look for past our own biases that our information saturation has put us in. So there's many instances where the AI model, just like the internet, social media, all these things that we use provide false information and very believable, but incorrect references to facts. In fact, the AI will double down on the misinformation, declaring it to be true. You can't question it kind of thing. So while each update tries to address the misinformation, realize that a lot of this is volume. It's a computer. It's not assessing something as reliably false. It isn't the equivalent of a five-year-old or a 10-year-old or a 15-year-old with all the life experiences. It is only dealing with the information that it's given. So while it can pass difficult tests like the bar exam, it really has a tough time with, again, what we actually probably deal with more than we think, complex multifactorial thoughts, such as pharmacy case questions. Now we know that ChatGPT obviously can truly revolutionize the healthcare industry, but there is you know, a quote that really stood out to me when I was researching into ChatGPT and all the things that could work with healthcare. And I thought that it was very important, you know, kind of start it out by stating it, which was, quote, this new conversational AI model can be your friend, philosopher and guide, and even your worst enemy. So what do you guys think about that? And what does it really mean for public health and healthcare? Um, so I would say that AI model seems to be a great source for information, but also being your worst enemy, it could give you a lot of false information or information that is not recently like updated. And using that information, not knowing where it exactly came from, can result in possibly the wrong outcomes, um, especially if dealing with a patient, you might be giving them misinformation, which could have a lot of consequences. Yeah, I think that yeah, again, uh, I sort of gave some examples of technology. Anything that's meant to assist us can fail. You know, I love my dishwasher, but when it doesn't work, 
and I spend as much time washing the dishes and fixing the dishwasher so it can help al allegedly reduce my time in the future, it's not there. And I think it's also sort of in a, in a bigger sphere is what we don't realize. I'm a couple generations separate from you guys, but technology changes so, so rapidly, right? So even 10 years ago, I was an associate professor even 10 years ago and teaching in our new building at the time, you know, we're still using the same tech, but we're just so much more advanced with so many kinds of engagement techniques and things like that. So an engagement, even that, if we engage with the wrong information and we aren't challenging it, and even as humans too, I may try to find a fact and I find seven different references that highlight the same fact. If they're all referencing the same thing, and a, a lot of my colleagues have found and I have found where there's circular references, AI is not going to, I don't believe, is programmed to detect those kind of circular references where there's one falsehood and it's just built upon and, and memorialized. Like, what, how do we define myths? What do I say all the time in my classes? Don't keep saying the myth because AI is going to hear the myth and not look at the but it's wrong because. And so it's very important that we saturate. And one of the goals of public health is saturate with the correct information, saturate with information that we that we don't know, right? Don't put well, we think it could be this, this, and this, because all that becomes text or images or things online. And we know that misinformation is more amplified than information. And so an AI is going to be programmed to say, well, I saw 10 times that vaccines do something bad in a misinformation way, and only two that it's good because it's not amplified because we don't amplify good things. And so the worst enemy really is that misinformation and to say, well, I've seen this all the time and I've heard this a lot of misinformation seems to attack our emotions. And so how do we make decisions? We make emotional decisions. So the interesting thing is, is that ChatGPT and other chatbots could just pl play upon our emotions, our, our need to help our patients. And, uh, and as Ash said, we, we really don't help them. Yeah, so we know that there are many different ways that it could help in terms of healthcare, such as improving access to healthcare information with safety warnings and also clinical trial data that pharmacists can use as well as new drug developments, su supporting telemedicine and improving health communication. However, it can also cause harm by spreading the misinformation, like you had said, Dr. Bradford, misdiagnosing, bias, privacy concerns, as well as disrupting the healthcare professional patient relationships. And this stuff may not even be their fault. It may just be what's out there in the current web searches, which I think is part of the reason why they don't update it as often, because it's just so difficult to stay so up to date with it. And having all these new things pop up day in and day out could cause all these different problems if it were to do it that fast. So there are several current uses of AI, which include reducing time spent on paperwork and documentation creation, which could theoretically increase the scant time spent with patients, caregivers, peers, and learners. Ideally, reinvestment in patients could also increase time spent on public health interventions from immunization screening and administration to implementing more USPHS guidelines to more time for follow-ups on medications and conditions that are proven to reduce costly readmissions and other healthcare encounters. AI like ChatGPT could even take over follow-ups, which we just discussed in terms of oncology and psycho-oncology in our journal club yesterday. Yeah, and I know that it is really interesting to see all the different ways that it could be used, but we did also mention a little earlier about bias and possible misinformation. So what is your take on these AI platforms and having that problem and how it could be implicated with patients and their healthcare providers? So one thing I noticed while playing around with chat GPT and AI platforms is that when you ask for a source, it often gives you the wrong source, which is often unrelated. So you don't really know where this information is coming from. The internet allows anyone to post. You don't have to be a healthcare professional. So that makes room for a lot of misinformation. I read a journal the other day about vaccines and how a lot of people who don't work in healthcare, such as celebrities, often make claims about vaccinations. Because of their large following, this information does spread very quickly and it causes a lot of hesitancy with getting things like vaccines. So you do worry about AI platforms possibly using this misinformation and displaying it to patients, which could further implement this worry and confusion in healthcare. Uh, very well said. In fact, it's, it's interesting in the vaccine class that I teach, some of the solutions that the students had were to get celebrities to do the positive message, right? So it's, but, it, and again, because of their following, I mean, if you have, I mean, it's amazing what I, I was on Twitter this morning, I think, and 
somebody said they put out some myth and they're like, why are you, why are people following this person for misinformation? So if we realize that humans are fallible and all that human information is what AI is using, how do you teach AI that this person with this large following who says a lot of medical things is not a doctor, right? Versus, or it's just a medical student because there's medical student famous like anti-vax folks who, who have some medical qualifications, but the three of us can understand that, but AI can't versus a doctor who probably doesn't have a big following or is not on major news networks or being cited in the newspaper. And those may not have weight. So it's sort of, it's kind of like how we judge articles to say, oh, well, this Cochrane review said that this drug is better than the other and all these caveats. You know, AI can really read that well, right? In fact, I just forwarded an email from my colleague about AI doing peer review of articles. And it's sort of, is AI a peer? Could it be an expert? It has the analysis of all of this information, but it also is not systematically removing the misinformation of that's a predatory journal or that doesn't apply to our country or that isn't the right policy. You know, there's, if you have all the information, you've got to have the right algorithms to do that. And if humans have difficulty with it, I think AI does too. And I think that a lot of people miss the fact that this is an AI generative model. It creates the messages, but there's going to be people that's working behind it. And those people that are working behind it, making that code to put in, to get all that data shown off to the public, those people and individuals could have their own bias in things as well, which could be expressed through the chat system unintentionally, but you know, it still happens. Uh, and these could be very concerning. The first iterations, again, not open to the public, but they did have very concerning things regarding people of color and those of different regions and backgrounds arguing that it may be even more dangerous than Googling your symptoms. It's, it's interesting, you know, in, in decades past, there were these famous studies that showed that Google could predict a flu outbreak before the CDC or other local public health officials, because you'd see this spike in flu and they went back and matched it to actual cases that did that. So, so that's great. And there's some problems with how that study methodology is. It's retrospective, you know, are you really predicting things or not? Uh, but I think it's been validated. But are you Googling the right symptoms? The right is it is it just learning this iterative process? I mean, maybe some of us. I'm gonna I'm gonna publicly say I'm a procrastinator. <laughs> it's, it's a problem. I know what it is. I know exactly why I'm doing it. But I keep doing the same things over and over again, right? So if human behavior does that. Take that to a multiple exponential way with AI, where it's rapidly relearning and relearning bad habits, and those habits are from those humans that, again. We have our biases. They don't make sense. They're societally driven, but that societal driven biases and discrimination are ensconced in the very databases that AIs use. And so we'll talk about solutions in a little bit, of, but it's it's basically educating people where it comes from. When you go on social media and it says this message may be false, or this is a celebrity, or this isn't a doctor. You know, I was watching Dr. Glaukenflecken, right? And he had, you know, this is a doctor in the US. It's like, oh. I know that, but it's helpful to make sure that the systems are actually telling us more about what that information comes from. Absolutely. So moving into another topic, you know, we're public health, this is the public health rotation. So what's the opinion on AI and implementing it into public health with topics like we've talked about throughout this rotation, like overdose response, policy development and regulations, possible teaching algorithms for new regulations and promotion of things like wellness vending machines? Um, so I think as far as implementation, it could be a great source for um, something like wellness vending machines, as far as like directing people to the locations or the websites in terms of something like an overdose response. I think your best bet is to find a doctor or go to a trusted source such as like the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, because when it does come to someone's health and well-being and their life, you want to make sure that you are getting the best information out there and that you know where it is coming from. Yeah, I think AI will, you know, I, I, I would like to see it be, you know, it, only humans can be creative, right? So again, the very big difference here is that we can take nothing and create something right? We can work better together. We work better when we're diverse. We work better when it's different genders or different races or different backgrounds. Uh, we end up with a better result. And that's from CEO boardrooms down to classrooms. We know all that works better when it's different. So if AI can be the ultimate in looking at all those differences and presenting different solutions, I think that would be good. 
but also in terms of targeted marketing. So a lot of a lot of our public health marketing is written by people who look like us or people who look like me. And I may not know what the group needs. You know, what do we say in overdose response or medications for opioid use disorder or things like that? It's we have to ask the people who are affected by the policies how they would do the policy, right? AI might be able to do that, but again, in that database, those voices are not mentioned. And our current policies, those voices, right, those opinions are not mentioned. So I think we can create databases of those voices. We get people with lived experience. We get folks who are most affected by things and plug it into AI and have it spit out, you know, targeted messages like there with human evaluation. Maybe there's a whole bunch of ways that they can evaluate it. In terms of regulation review, you guys just did some great reviews for our new regulations in Rhode Island on scope of practice expansion. You know, could AI have run, you know, maybe we should do that later today is to say, hey, Jack GPT, what are the essential tasks that need to be trained for a pharmacist to do the best pre-exposure prophylaxis training or the best hormonal contraceptive prescribing? Who knows what it'll come up with? Maybe that's the guide. Maybe it's actually looking at all those regs and we don't have to mentally do that. So it's all about sort of helping all those steps in the process, creating outlines for papers, but not creating the words, things like that. Yeah, I think it's definitely good as like a jumping off point, kind of. You you, you got like a basis of what you want to do. You have some thoughts, but you don't really know where to go with it. ChatGPT could come in, try to be that gap. And then you could move forward with your own plan and finish it up. There was actually one article that I had read that actually looked at evaluators when comparing a physician to ChatGPT or roughly just any sort of AI program at the time. They covered about 600 different patient-centered conversations and found that they actually preferred the AI's response about 79% of the time. So with that in mind, where do you guys kind of think that the AI models could best fit into the healthcare system? So I would say that AI might be a source for like your basic healthcare information for like a disease state or a certain medication, but you would always want to like consult with a healthcare provider as well. A lot of times when you are taking medications, there are specific things to keep in mind, such as drug interactions and dose changes with the other medications that a patient may be taking as well as a lot of side effects. So although that AI might give you a quick and easy to understand answer, your healthcare provider is providing a lot of those details that are necessary to know to assure that you do get your full healthcare experience and care. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, we were talking yesterday and about motivational interviewing and how to understand where the patient's coming from and having a truly situational and person-centered recommendation for them. Now we're all looking at the databases. We could all look at a drug. We're talking about over-the-counter drugs that people have access to on their own. You know, would we rather have AI give them some information about that drug than nothing? Yeah. Would we rather them talk to their pharmacist? Sure. We've talked about changing the capitalistic healthcare system in the US so that, you know, maybe we can have this time better reimbursed. And you know what, if more people had more accurate information or more people had at least the basis of information from a non-biased source, because we all have our biases in humans, you know, I think there's ways I'm going to be optimistic to say, to sort of reduce the stigma, provide that anonymized, uh, anonymized access to care and say, yeah, an AI is not going to talk to you. But if you come into the conversation where the provider, the student, the trainer, the trainee, the mentor, the mentee, all have some like the same basic information. I think we can go a lot further instead of, you know, someone who really believes some myth about some drug and you spend your entire time, very limited time, trying to convince them otherwise, maybe AI in some idealized way provides that foundation. And then the humans can do that motivational interviewing to say, what are your concerns? Where did those concerns come from? Let's address them. And we can provide, you know, just really more optimal care. I definitely agree. I think that one thing that ChatGPT, I don't think we'll ever be able to fully be capable of is building that rapport with the patient. You know, having that relationship between the provider and the patient is what I think healthcare providers are meant to be doing, but who who knows what the future holds, honestly. I think that pushing ChatGPT as more of an assistant to the practitioner is probably what would be the most beneficial right now. I mean, we've seen technologies throughout the past decade of things like improving surgery with laparoscopic techniques, uh, ventilators, as well as electronic health records being full-blown within the past like decade to two decades. 
and working more on the administrative side of healthcare, like I had mentioned earlier with like having all the paperwork that providers will have to go through from a day-to-day basis, you know, reducing that by sending it over to an AI model could hopefully reduce burnout in providers, uh, provide greater time with the patient and um, have a more direct line of communication with them. Yeah, I think all those things are great. I think it's important to think about when we thought of the future, even just a few decades ago, we said, we'll all be driving flying cars. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of like, we just barely got to cars that allegedly sort of drive themselves. And a recent report showed that those cars were involved in a lot of accidents. And so if, if I'm driving on the road and robots essentially are driving the cars, who again have speed and reflexes and, you know, literally see the physics that we can't see. We don't trust that. You know, we have robots that do surgery that allows us to do surgery using experts manipulating things on one side and then the other side. That's great. We can do Zoom conversations. We're going to have, you know, one with somebody in British Columbia tomorrow. I think it's phenomenal that we'll be interviewing them for the, the podcast. So I think that we just have to keep our skepticism up in, in almost any kind of technology we use but then also not be so skeptical that we never use technology. You know, I, I don't think we'd find a provider who's like, please, can I write in charts? <laughs> or a pharmacy student or any kind of student who says, please, I'd like to read through this ICU chart for you know two weeks of paper information of writing I can't understand. We really do like electronic records. How do we use them? How does AI help us? How do we standardize those messages? So, so Lucas and Ash, what is the regimen for our use of chat GPT in healthcare? I would say it definitely is a cool introduction to healthcare, but it is important to realize that we can only use it so much in healthcare and we still do need our providers and pharmacists to help out out as well and contribute to the patient's care. That being said, guidelines are changing currently and all the time. We don't know how often ChatGPT is being changed and kept up with guidelines. I know even in 2023, we've had an introduction of many new medications, uh, many new guidelines. So it is always important to keep up with that information. Yeah, I think moving it more towards an administrative side for ChatGPT would probably be best in terms of the healthcare field. Moving forward, I feel like if it were more clinical-based, there could be a lot of misinformation just due to the inability to keep up with the constant updates and guidelines. So I think moving forward, I think that would be best for AI models. But again, who knows what the future holds? They're working on the docs GPT with with physicians specifically that could help provide better outcomes, at least in the world of healthcare, as well as an administrative workload. Yes, absolutely. We'll keep monitoring this and maybe in a year we'll have a whole different, in a year the AI is just going to write the whole script and uh, we'll just we'll just sit here. It'll be great. Right now they can't write scripts. I, I know they've written movies before, but not, not the script for the regimen here. Uh, so be sure if you like this episode, there's a ton more in our catalog and a ton more coming throughout the summer. Be sure to follow at PharmD Pub Health for all kinds of public health information on all of our social channels. That's at PharmD Pub Health on Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn. Turn on post notifications so you never miss an episode. Smash that subscribe button now on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or Amazon Music, or wherever you listen to podcasts so you never miss an episode. Thanks.